Okay, welcome to the uh, June meeting of the Astro Imaging Special Interest Group. Uh, as we've been doing for the past few months, um, if we have any new folks who just joined us, uh, feel free to uh, speak up and introduce yourself. Uh, we usually have the first part of the meeting now uh, open for beginners' comments, questions, and uh, other general discussion. So, any new members? Well, I'm, I'm not a new member, but it's the uh, first time I've been in, in a meeting for quite a while. I used to attend the meetings when they were at the Total Wine, but it was quite a wow. while. So I'm Gene. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right. Any, uh, any folks have any beginners type questions? I got one I can throw out, Greg. I think about it every year about this time. What is the heat tolerance of our rigs stored in the shade on a July Tucson day? Can they with under, you know, under appropriate covers on a porch out of the sun, can they withstand 107, 108, 109 degrees? My gut tells me they can, but I'd love to hear people's experience. Good question. I've I never taken mine in. I leave it out on the trolley. Um, and it's so it has not been a problem, at least that I've experienced. And Randy, that's the whole rig, the OTA camera mount, the works. Yes. It if I know I'm not going to use the camera for a while, I'll just bring it in more more for security than anything. Right. But uh, but not not just for that, not for heat. And you know, I looked up the operating ranges of of the equipment, and you know, a laptop or a, a mini PC can operate up to you know the core of it can operate up to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, the cameras have a wider operating range than we get temperatures in Tucson. Um, I believe I found some mount data at one point. Um, so, and plus, I figure if you put them out in an observatory in Tucson, it's not going to be air conditioned. All right. So, I have them out uh, in a mine in the observatory, but uh, I keep two extraction. This time of year, I got two extraction fans that go twenty four seven. So you're you're moving air, but you're not air conditioning it, Alan, or are you? No, no, I'm not air conditioning. Okay, so you're not building up the heat, but if it's 107 outside, it's going to be 107 inside. Probably. I've insulated the walls, and uh, I plan on insulating. Uh, it's a roll-off roof. Right. I'm still in my plans to add some insulation to the roof. If the floor is raised in an observatory, will that um, dissipate some of the heat as well? I'm sorry, say it again. If the floor of the observatory is not directly like a, on the ground, like you would if you just set a tripod with your equipment. Uh, will that make a difference? I don't know. Because I was I was talking to Dean about this at Star Arizona, and he's kind of, you know, if it's really hot and we have extreme heat, he's concerned that the um, and I don't know if he's experienced or not, but the chips themselves, the electronic gadgetry with the equipment. Yeah. In ASI air or your camera or whatever, that the heat can affect those if they're sitting in the sun all day, even with a cover. Um, the other thing is, depending on what mount you have, I have the AVX mount. There's all this like lubricating fluid or whatever is inside the mount. He said you'll start to lose that in the heat, it'll dissipate. And that makes sense to me because sometimes I'll take the mount down until I use it the next time and I'll bring it in the house and I'll notice that it's a little bit greasy on the outside. That means that it's, you know, the heat itself is causing the fluid in it to leak or do something to it. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't leave the gear in the sun under, even under a cover. Yeah. Um, that, that doesn't strike me as a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I could, I could throw in my two cents for it. So I, I have a Takahashi NJP. And I've had it since 2000, well, so I've been here since 2005. And what I've done 
is I've I, I've left it out in 100 degree plus temperatures for weeks on end. And what I do is that I, I cover it with um, with some heavy duty uh, trash bags and uh, and then they um, th that's to keep the dust out. And it's on a me tripod out, out in the sun in my pool deck. Um, so uh, and then on top of that, I just have a a, 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 a cover for your for your grill. But the, the key okay. thing which allows me to leave it out there is I got that that aluminized bubble wrap that you put in your walls. And I cover I cover that, um, and and I I hold it I, I just drape it over I, I should have I wish I had a picture of it but I just hold it together with clothespins and I cover the whole thing, and um, it it works remarkably well. Um, two weeks ago when it was 110, I put a thermometer inside the mount in the middle of the, you know late afternoon and it was still below 100, um, and 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 I've been doing this for years. Um, and I haven't, I haven't noticed any uh, grease or anything um, leaking from the sides of the, you know, like where, where the, um, you know, where the covers would be. And it's, it's been working fine since then. Um, yes. so, yeah. So, yeah, but that, 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 you know, if I didn't have that bubble wrap, I wouldn't even think about doing it, but, but that stuff's amazing. It works really well. Yeah. Well, I have the Telegizmo 360 cover that I bought this past year and that works well during normal conditions but when it's super hot out here i just plus when it's windy i'll just take the thing in it it for me it doesn't take much to set up the equipment it's not that heavy um i mean the avx tripod's the heaviest thing out of the whole thing but other than that it doesn't take me long to set it up and the other reasoning i have for keeping it set up for several nights in a row of, of imaging if the weather's conducive to it was just so I wouldn't have to repolar align. But what I'm finding is, at least with the ASI Air, I might get a great polar alignment the night before, and then I'll set it for polar alignment again, and it needs some tweaking to it. So maybe not as much, but it maybe it's the rotation of the Earth or something. I could be wrong, but it looks like the I rotation of Green Valley. All right, it's the rotation of Green Valley. So I don't know. I don't live in Greenville. I live in Vail. <laughs> or Vail, excuse me. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, so do I. <laughs> There's a really interesting uh, YouTube video that I just watched just uh, just a week ago about this very topic. And this fellow, I believe he lives in Texas. He has two rigs that he leaves out year round covered with 365 degree um, covers. And he has a YouTube video if anybody's interested. I don't know how to link anything. I'm not that tech. <laughs> savvy but it he's called dso imager is his uh user on uh, name or whatever on youtube and it, the title of his youtube video is astrophotography leaving your gear out in the summer heat and what he did basically was he's left it out for two seasons and he has gone out in the several times during the day using a thermal heat imager and tested the temperatures on all of his rigs to see what kind of temperatures on the exterior of the cover were and then checked what they were on the interior as well. And it was, it was, it was an eye opener because I like many of you, I would not have thought leaving your equipment out in this kind of heat was a smart thing to do. But um, his after two seasons didn't show any, any adverse effects. And, and uh, you can watch the video and draw your own conclusions, but it is interesting because he does have data to back it up with this thermal imager and he records it over a period of uh, several months during the, 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 the hot season. But uh, again, his, he's called DSO imager on YouTube and it might be worth watching if you're one of the people that leaves your, your stuff out year round. It's uh, leaving your gear out in the summer heat. Yeah, the title of his particular, particular YouTube uh, video is called Astrophotography, Leaving Your Gear Out in the Summer Heat, correct? Yeah, I got it here. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll post it in the chat. I, uh, I'm no expert. I'm the beginner here. <laughs> but uh, I leave my stuff outside. I have a, a pretty good cover. Uh, and, you know, I'm just, what's going to happen will happen. And you know, I, I have no, I have no good place to move it anywhere else. It's kind of a pain to put up and take down. Uh, the one, the one weather thing that I 
have now begun to take seriously is wind. Uh, I had a windstorm blow my rig over. And it was that was responsible for all the trouble I was bugging you guys about a month ago. And thank you all for telling me to go to Star Arizona. They got that thing right. It works now. But now I mean, like it's I took it down now. Well, what kind of scope is it that you have? It was a Celestron C8. It oh. it I I had it collimated, but it needed more than collimation. What it kind needed... of mount? I mean, it, it AVX. Something... Okay, so the wind can blow that over. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Paul, there was a post on the astrophysics chat this week. Somebody with an AP eleven hundred mount, which is about a forty five pound mount with a C11 on top, the rig, the weather changed on him suddenly, the whole thing blew over. Uh, remarkably, other than a, uh, some cosmetic damage, everything still works. Oh boy, was he lucky. Yeah. Well, mine had a little more than cosmetic damage. Uh, but Dean was just wonderful. He fixed it and uh, I got to watch him, which was kind of, you know, I, I go over there and I don't know the another one of the guys said that uh, yeah I'd probably be ready be ready in two days and then Dean walked over and asked what what it was about and the first question he asked me was where do you live and I didn't know why he asked that as well I'm on the east side Sivano and he said you know I think I have enough time to take care of this now nice. And, so you don't have to make an, another trip. I just thought that was great. When did this happen, by the way? When did it go? When did it blow over? Yeah. Like six months ago. Oh. And I had the thing collimated, so I figured it was all right. But so you mean in, in December there was a wind like that? I didn't remember because. Yeah, it was uh, maybe November. <clears throat> it was. It was. It was a bad one. <laughs> I live in Vail also. Uh, we had a we had a fair weather hurricane in in uh, April just before the eclipse, and I had a an awning taken out. Huh. In the process of getting that uh, replaced, and that's why, well. You know, I go to CAC and I set up for several days, and that's that's why I go for several days yeah. to do imaging and not yeah. have to set up, you know, each day. And so I leave it out. And that's so you know, I was listening to all you guys. Sometimes it can get a little warm there, but you know, not usually over a hundred out there. Yeah. I suspect our our risk is a lot more about wind than it is about heat, because. Yeah. Uh, I have I've yet to hear anybody say leaving it out uh, and had heat damage, and I know people that leave leave everything out with the three sixty five covers, and it all works. But I've heard a lot of people <laughs> have the wind issue. What are so three sixty five covers? That that's the brand that. Uh, um, Gizmo. Paul. Yeah, Telegizmo. They. That is oh, their that's, what that's, I that's their top of the line cover. It's intended to be left out 365 days a year. That's why they call it. That. Is it a canvas like thing? And it's because I have a cover like that that I. It, if it came from Telegizmo and it says 365, then that's what you've got. And it's got okay. aluminum on the inside. Yeah. And they tell you, uh, my first thought was, oh, I want to put it on the outside. They said, do no. not do that. It goes right. on the inside. Yeah. So. You do want to put a towel between your gear and that uh, cover, though, because the inside gets fragile. Yeah. Huh. Uh, if you had any sharp edges on your, oh. on your scope, that, that's why you put the towel inside, just to cushion that cover so you don't poke a hole in it. I also disconnect cables when I use it because I found if I leave cables on and you're taking the cover off, it can get snagged. Yeah. They're not real easy to put on and take off, especially if your scope is, you try covering up a C11 
on a mount and it's hard to even I'm pretty tall and it's still not easy to get that thing on there and you may have to leave it out in the sun so it gets pliable enough if you've got it stored inside and it's folded up it's not the easy it I found lots of reasons not to cover it up <laughs> yeah, but the, yeah. it doesn't but work as a, well if you don't put it on Randy yeah I'm under a patio cover and there's no direct wind and there's no direct sun so I don't worry too much about it so. um, I use a cover that's from I think it's from Astro Systems. It's a, it's kind of a canvas-like thing, but it's kind of flexible and it's, it's durable and it's white. It, it comes in, yeah. uh, and it seems to it's, it's served me well. I've gotten two. I have one that I keep a fourteen-inch reflector covered out of CAC, and then sometimes I keep I have a smaller one to keep either my six-inch refractor. Or or 10 inch reflector if we're out. Or if I'm out at the Grand Canyon, I use 10 inch reflector. And I use that and it's it's protected from rain. It's, and it's durable, it's not fragile. So Jeff, did we answer your question? I think you did, thank you. <laughs> yeah, good discussion. Yeah. All right, um, I've asked uh, David and Randy to tell us a little bit about uh, the gear that they're currently using, as those of you who've been uh, on this meeting in the past will re remember that both David and Randy um, started off using Hyperstar, I believe, and then decided they needed to try something different. So I asked them to talk about the something different that they uh, uh, migrated to. And so I'm going to let David uh, start off and tell us uh, what he did after he mastered the hyperstar. David, okay. you ready? Uh, we'll be in a second. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yeah. Great. Excellent. So, um, yeah, so I, I put this together like this afternoon, <laughs> uh, but uh, I wanted to keep this short and sweet because I, I knew that Randy would also be talking after me. By the way, this is M106. Um, and I want to talk about first to put things in context, uh, what my overall objectives were, were and why I bought the, the equipment that I did to begin with, with the hyper stuff. So after a lot of research, after my wife gave me the green light and said, let's buy a telescope, um, I had some things I put together, things I was looking for. And first was, I want to be able to use a scope for visual and imaging and the C8 of course fits that any of the. Celestron C series can be used for visual, but to be totally honest about it, I think I used it for visual for about a week, and I said, "Forget it. I want to, I want to start doing some imaging." Um, I wanted uh, a system where I could do a wide field of view for uh, nebula season, as well as uh, close, uh, actually, uh, to get closer for deep sky objects or more distant objects, um, and, and and a longer focal length for that matter. Um, and then light gathering was very important with me. I think I was waffling between should I get the C6 or the C8 because I had a budget I had in mind. And um, one of the people from the ASIC group, his name is Tom. I don't think he's on tonight, but um, he was the one that I saw at one of the stargazing parties at Star Arizona. And he said, look, um, you want to get the eight. That's a good mid-range system especially for beginner. If you go with the six, you're going to be really limited. So I went with the C8. Um, of course, I had a budget. And then what the, the most important thing for me also was ease of use. I didn't want to be one of those people that bought all the equipment and six months to a year later ended up selling it because I didn't know what I was doing, how to use it properly. So in December of 2022, I purchased the base system was with the advanced AVX-8 which included the Celestron AVX EQ mount and the C8 itself. Um, I also bought the Hyperstar 8, uh, which is probably just as expensive as the C8. Um, I got the ASI Air Plus, the uh, electronic autofocuser, um, the 533 camera, and uh, I bought the Optolong L Pro light pollution filter. Because even though I'm in a World 4 area, technically, 
I call it a Bordeaux four-ish because I got a school just north of me that has its parking lights until 11 o'clock on the weeknights and 10 o'clock on the weekends. And uh, west of us, we do get some light pollution from from Tucson and from Vail as well. So um, you're facing east. It's pretty decent. By the way, uh, where in Vail are you? I'm in the Del Webb at Rancho Del Lago. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just north of you. I'm just north of Rex Molly Drive. Oh, okay. I'm, Got it. I'm White Lightning Lane. I'm two blocks north oh, yeah. of Ocotillo uh, Ridge Elementary School. Yes, yes. Well, that's the school that's just north of my backyard. Oh, okay. Yeah. And if you notice, they their lights are now off at 11 o'clock as opposed to 11.30 during the weeknight. That's because I contacted them about it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they well, were that's one way they can save money. You know, school districts always say they're hard up. Well, it'd be better to lay off lights than to lay off teachers. Yeah. <laughs> well, they have it on for security purposes. But in any case, um, so I got the Smith Cassegrain telescope um, and, and just let's bear in mind that when I went into this hobby, I had 0, 0.0 knowledge of astronomy and astro imaging. I had a good background in photography because I've been involved in as an amateur photographer for the past 20 years. But, it, but in terms of this hobby itself, I, I knew absolutely nothing. So I, I uh, went to Star Arizona. They, they helped fit me up with the right equipment that I needed. Um, the thing I want to point out about this SCT telescope, and I know many of you are probably familiar with this already, uh, but for those who aren't, there's a secondary mirror. And if you remove this secondary mirror right now, the way it's configured, it would be the native focal length of 2032, uh, F10 aperture. But when you bring in the hyperstar and replace that secondary mirror with the hyperstar itself, um, now you've converted it from an F10 aperture to a 1.9 and a 390 millimeter focal length. Um, and you're shooting at about 28 times faster in terms of light gathering than an F10. So for me, that was great. I didn't start guiding at first. I just went ahead and did my 30 to 60 second exposures until I got the hang of it. Uh, my next phase of my plan, which I warned my wife about, was I was going to buy a guide scope and a guide camera. So I did that, had success with that. And then I went on to, to getting the, uh, the, the, figure for, the configuration for Galaxy Season. Um, I also use the uh, ASI Air Plus. Uh, I'm not the type of person that likes to tinker with stuff. And I wanted to make this as simple as possible. And it just so happens the timing when I bought my scope and my rig was that the ASI Air was on the scene for about two or three years. They came out with the ASI Air Plus, which had an antenna attached to it. Uh, I'm getting great reception with Wi-Fi with this unit, and I use it as part of my normal Wi-Fi in what's called station mode as well. So it works extremely well. Uh, very rarely do I lose a connection. But I use this to power everything except my mount. My mount is set up separately on a 12-volt uh, splitter with my battery that I use. Uh, to hook it up, but it's it's totally separate from that. Um, I do my polar alignment. I don't use a polar scope for that. I set up the EAF with it so that I could have it automatically focused because as we all know, as temperatures change, so does your focus. So I didn't want to have to babysit that all night. Um, in fact, I got this thing set up to the point where once I get things set up with an object, I'm shooting it all night typically. And I'll just go to sleep and wake up the next day, do my flats if I need to do so, and it's all done, um, unattended. So this is how it's set up now for galaxy season. That is my observatory, if you want to call it that. <laughs> um, but it's right by the fire pit. I know exactly what bricks to align my tripod with. And um, I, I have a little app on my phone that I use to make sure it's set up as north as possible before I set it up. Um, and then from there, just set up the mount. Um, if my telescope isn't already attached for the night before using, for example, a cover, uh, it, it takes me maybe 15 minutes to 
set it up in 15 minutes to tear it down. So it's fairly easy to work with. Uh, typically, I'll keep the whole image train together so I don't have to do flats again. Um, so I'll just unseat it from the dovetail and I'll carefully bring it into the house and set it up in a guest room where we have a bed that I can carefully lay it on so I don't have to worry about reconfiguring everything again. Um, if you look at the close-up here, um, and, and I think this is around 95 or so millimeters uh, required for the back focus, but I'm not exactly sure. Very frankly, I went into Star Arizona and Steve from Star Arizona set the whole thing up for me. Um, I knew a couple of years in advance that this was the configuration I was going to get or something similar to it. Um, and, and the reason is because I had planned for this. I knew I wanted to shoot from the back of the image train initially when I bought the C8 with the Hyperstar. Um, I bought the 174 millimeter guide camera specifically for that because even though I could get away with a 120 um, or maybe a 220 with, with the regular guide scope, I knew this would be uh, more sensitive to picking up stars once I went with the off-access guider. Um, I also used the Star Arizona SCT corrector. It's it's as a multifaceted um, uh, capabilities. It does the uh, reducing. It, it it brings it down from um, twenty three hundred native focal length to about fourteen fifty. It also has a, a corrector and a coma reducer and a flattener all built in. And this was made by Star Arizona specifically for SCT type scopes. Um, you cannot use this on a refractor. So it's specifically designed uh, for, the, for the SCT. Um, and then with that, I have the ASCAR OAG. You know, a lot of people were telling me I should go with the Celestron, the largest size one they have. But for this particular CA, uh, that can be a problem. Um, and it's pretty much with the C8. If you had a C9 or a C11, you could go with the larger Celestron OAG. But with this particular model, you need to have either the standard ZWO, not the large size ZWO OAG, or you need to have something like the ASCAR. The um, thing I really like about this is it has a helical focus knob on it. The first night when I brought, set it up, uh, the only thing I had to do was focus the ASCAR on the stars. And then from there, it's been acting flawlessly. I've not had any situations where I wasn't able to pick up a star unless there was a cloud that went by. But other than that, uh, it's been working like a charm. So in terms of pros, um, the reason I like this configuration for galaxies is um, the field of view. I can now um, get a better view, uh, a better composition for galaxies without having to do a significant amount of cropping. Although for some galaxies I, and objects, I still have to do that, but not, not where anywhere near is doing it at 390 millimeters. Uh, I find that guiding is more accurate with the OAG versus my guide scope. And I attribute that more to flexure because you know, I got pinpoint guiding with the OAG with the guide scope. There's there's always that variance that's not as aligned as well as it could be. Um, and it pairs well with the C8. Um, cons are balancing could be a challenge. One of the first things I found out was because it's very back heavy with the weight, um, I needed additional weight on the front end of the scope. So I went back to Star Arizona, got myself a two pound weight screwed it into the, uh, into the unit, into the, um, uh, the C8 itself, and I was able to balance it properly. And then I found if I just use my aluminum dew shield, which I like to use um, primarily because it acts like a really nice lens hood for my scope, um, that that does just as effective as a job. Um, but if I'm not using the lens hood or the, the dew shield, then I would definitely have to use the weight with it as well. Um, going at F7 was quite a change for me and quite a challenge because I'm used to be able to use the Hyperstar and shoot all my exposures in one night and then call it a day. Uh, but with shooting at F7, I've had to devote sometimes three or four nights to an object uh, in order to get the signal that I needed uh, for proper processing. Otherwise, I found my 
images looked really muddy in terms of the backgrounds. Um, I didn't have as much detail, as much color. And um, just that's just the fact when you're shooting at that kind of a of an aperture, you need to shoot multiple nights to get the detail. And sometimes finding a guide star can be prob problematic, but that's usually attributed to uh, your, your uh, OAG is not properly focused or your scope is not focused properly to begin with, or there's some cloud cover. But other than that, it's worked out really well. David, I have a, a couple of questions. I think you answered one of them on, the, on your uh, image of your setup. You showed that you had a... Uh, um, a, a, um, a dew shield or what you call yeah. it, a lens hood. Uh, is that mainly to keep dew off the scope or to no, block um, light? I don't have any dew issues out here in Arizona, as not people know. It's just, um, even though I'm in a B4, I got my, as you can see, I got my neighbor right next door to me. When he takes his dog out for a walk, he's got these security lights <laughs> and he was actually kind enough to move one of them so it wasn't blasting on my scope. <laughs> uh, so they angled it differently. I have that. I have the school that that provides some additional emissions. Normally, though, I'm pretty lucky. My The only obstruction I have is, of course, my neighbor's house and my own house. Anything that's low in the horizon on the west side, is I'm not going to be able to get to it. But I'm finding most of these objects I want to shoot start in the east. And if they're high enough in the sky, it's not even an issue. Uh, but there, there's enough light pollution around me, uh, both from the north and from the uh, western sky, uh, that it, it's not perfectly dark. It's not like going to the CAC Center. So I find that when the wind is favorable and it's not over five miles per hour, I can get away using the dew shield. If, if it's over five or six, my my uh, RMS errors are a lot higher when I'm guiding. And I find that um, even though Blur Exterminator can help me out in those situations, um, it's it's best to take the dew shield off and put a little bit of a weight uh, on the front end. My other question was, you use different cameras for the Hyperstar versus the F7 setup? Well, I, I have the, uh, the, the 2600 was a new acquisition for me, um, mainly because I was um, tired of having to use mosaics or try to use mosaics on certain objects when I could have just had an APC size sensor to, to use it, especially for nebula season. Um, but I, I bought it towards the end of nebula season but for me, I I like that camera because it does have an IR UV cut filter built into it. So if I want to try and experiment and go without a filter, I can use it. I still have the 533. Uh, I'm just not using it. Now. I'm using the 2600. I, I guess my question was, can you use the same camera at either end of the scope? Yes, I, mean, I have. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most definitely. Yeah, I can use it with the Hyperstar. And I can use it with the, with the back end. The only difference is instead of being uh, one point nine, it, it brings it up a couple of notches. So, like I think it's two point oh or two point three. It's still relatively fast, mm -hmm. um, but it does affect the aperture when I'm shooting in the front with it. Okay. So the I, I think that's a, a great presentation, and and I think um, the setup that you're using, the one you showed us here, is something that a lot of folks. Um, oh end up using seems like it any other any other questions for david i have yep. one um sure. i don't uh i'm a beginner right but can you explain a little what this ascar m54 off access guider does how it works i mean what yeah I mean, yeah so you're at right angle to the i, I just don't understand. yeah basically all it is is it, it has a um that round piece that fits in between the um, the filter drawer and the camera. And what any OAG does, it's going to pick up the light, a, a portion of the light coming in to your main camera. Uh, it's going to be out of the field of view of your sensor, but it's able to pick up um, the light so it can see the stars and pick up some of the stars that 
where a lot of people that, so this is a use in, in place of using a guide scope and a guide camera together. It's the same guide camera that I use on my ASCAR 40 millimeter guide scope when I'm setting it up with the Hyperstar to use it for guiding, uh, but it's a, just a different configuration. And when you're shooting it at this type of a focal length, you really need to have an OAG to do it properly. And where a lot of people go wrong from what I've read in various forms is they get the wrong OAG. It doesn't fit well. It, it, it They don't pick up enough light because of it. So I was warned by Scott and by Steve at Star Arizona, don't go with a large Celestron, even, when, even though people are telling you to go with that OAG, because you're going to have problems finding stars. And same thing with the camera. Uh, I know John DeSantis, we got the same configuration around the same time for the back of the image train here. The only difference was he had a 120 camera and I have a 174 and he was having a heck of a time trying to find stars until he got the 174. So it's just a matter of getting the right configuration set up to do this successfully. I was very concerned about this before I got into it. That was the one thing I was dreading was setting up this configuration, but I actually found out it was actually easier than using the guide camera that I have set up with the Hyperstar. It was very, very easy to set up. Uh, David, do you ever rotate the whole system? I have not attempted to do that yet. I haven't had a need to do it. And that's the only unknown is that if I do rotate it, um, there could be an issue. But the way I would rotate it, you see that silver screw on the left side um that's how i would rotate it i would rotate the whole thing and i was told by the folks at star arizona rotate it to the right rotate it clockwise but do not go the other way <laughs> so you just loosen that screw up the retaining screw you move it to the right and, and you can do that but so far i haven't had a need to do it and and the reason is with with the galaxies they're they're small enough as they are, even at fourteen hundred and fifty focal length, that it doesn't matter whether it's horizontal or whether it's it's vertical. In most cases, unless you have several objects you want to capture at the same time, but most of the time it's dead center, so it doesn't matter how I have it set up. Greg, uh, just to add to that uh, that part that David's talking about. Um, is another Star Arizona proprietary product. They call it the virtual back instead of a visual back. And what it allows you to do is just by loosening a screw, uh, you can now rotate the entire image train and then you just tighten it back up. It's not like you're having to unthread something. So it's, it is super handy if you're doing a star party and with a diagonal on the back, because you can easily uh, change it for different height of people. Just you can rotate that um, star diagonal without losing any focus. And that's kind of where it works the best, but it's also great to use uh, in this application too. I will also say when I was doing off axis guiding with this same setup, I just gave up and quit because the ASCAR um, uh, OAG was not available at that time. Uh, your only option was the small uh, ZWO. Right. And the, the prism on that is so tiny that it was hard to find a guide star and hold it. And you might have to rotate the camera a lot just to find a guide star. So I think this ASCAR um, OAG is a huge improvement. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it, 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 it makes it work. Yeah, and, I also um, went to Amazon and uh, Steve's recommendation at Star Zone was to get some shorter cables. Yeah. So I have like the um, the ZWO EAF that's hooked into my camera's port for the USB port. Uh, same thing with the guide camera. So I'm trying to minimize the cables um, and I was able to get shorter cables for that. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, we're gonna turn it over to Randy and let him talk about uh, another common uh, uh, imaging setup using a, a Newtonian reflector yeah. for the 
main optical tube. Let me get my slideshow going here. Okay, I call this my evolution <laughs> to a Newtonian scope. And this is uh, over the five years that I've been doing this. <clears throat> I started just like what David did with Selectron, uh, Celestron C8, Sardona a Hyperstar AVX mount. And back then you had two choices of cameras, the 294 or a 183. It was before the 533 or uh, 2600 were available. And as David said, you're at 390 millimeters, you're at F2, and this was a pixel size of 4.63. But it was a good place to start. It was easy to use. The heaviest component was maybe 15 pounds. And um, so it's mo where most people are starting, at least if they go to Star Arizona, they're probably going to leave with that rig. Um, then, but again, as David pointed out, um, you get pretty, uh, once you get into galaxy season, it's very frustrating because you don't have enough image size to do much. So you added, I added the, the same reducer and off axis guider. Uh, and I tried to do it with a 120 camera, it didn't work. I had to go to the 174 guide camera with a much larger sensor. And so now you're at, uh, basically 1400 or 1450 at f7 and this pixel size worked well at that uh, focal length um, <clears throat> and then my avx mount must not have been as good as david's because i had nothing but trouble with it i finally gave up on it moved to the eq6r pro skywatcher and that was a much better mount and I was able to uh, shoot this configuration. I probably did uh, well over half of my imaging was with the um, uh, reducer at, at the high focal length. I, but I still wanted more uh, image size and I was tired of using the, uh, trying to use the um, reducer it just, the frustration of it. And at this time, Doug Summers was just putting together his rig where he had his RASA 11 and uh, the 183 camera. And he was getting such good results that um, I talked to him some about it and I decided, okay, I'm going there. Now the EQ6 mount would not handle a RASA 11. It's just too heavy. And I wasn't ready to go for a heavier mount at the time. So my alternative was to go to a, with a C11 and a Hyperstar and a 183 camera. Uh, this gave me a focal length of 540, whereas a RASA would be clear up to 620. Uh, but I still very fast at 1.9. And with the 183 camera, you had the small 2.4 uh, nanometer uh, uh, pixels. So I, this worked very well. I took a lot of good pictures with this. I did not have the frustration of the um, of the off-axis guider, and I still had the very fast optics. So that's then I moved up, uh, upgraded my cameras to the twenty six hundred uh, color, and then I added the twenty six hundred mono. Uh, jumps just jumped into the deep end. Uh, this got me this 3.76 pixel size. And with the, uh, unlike the 183, you had the backlit sensor uh, virtually, uh, well, there's no amp flow and you had hardly any noise. And I got moved into the SHO filters in the LRGB. Um, but I had, to, I had to manually change the filters. So if you're going mono, uh, that gets you into your biggest problem uh, it, with a Hyperstar setup. I did figure out how to label the subframes. And if you're able to label them as if you were using a filter wheel, uh, then uh, you can throw everything into weighted batch pre-processing. You know, all your, all your um, calibration frames and all of your filters uh, subs and 
a weighted batch processing will process them all in one uh, step and it will um, align everything. So you come out with subs that are just ready to start working with and you don't have to do anything else with them. So here's what I ended up with, um, with Hyperstar on the front, that's a 183 camera. And uh, I also use the ASI Air. I switched to that uh, pretty quickly on and uh, I would never go back just because as David said, I don't want to mess with all the technical stuff and settings. This works and it works reliably. So the only other downside other than not being able to use a filter wheel for mono was that this is a heavy rig um, and it's an awkward heavy rig for uh, putting on and off the, um, uh, the uh, your mount. But it worked well, it took great pictures. And um, so I, I was very pleased with this. I used this probably the better part of three years. So I was still, my one frustration was I wanted that filter wheel, and, but I didn't want to go backwards from the quality that you could get with a C11, meaning the image size and all. So my solution was the Skywatcher Quattro 200P 8 inch Newtonian. And this was, <clears throat> I had looked at the 10 inch Newtonian. It was big, heavy and awkward and I wasn't ready to get there, it was gonna be right at the top end of my EQ6 mount um, capacity. So, but the eight inch uh, gave me 800 millimeter focal length at F4 with a just a 1.0 corrector. But the way I use it most of the time is with the uh, Starzona Nexus reducer that's at, so it gives you 600 millimeter focal length and F3. And frankly, I couldn't see that much difference between F2 and F3. I could still shoot objects in one night and get plenty of signal. Now, the downside, the Skywatcher 200P is basically a piece of junk. Um, it has a terrible focuser on it. Uh, so I upgraded that to a Starlight focuser, which is really good. Um, the spider in it, uh, is like spaghetti. It it's not stable. So there's a a company called um, a Backyard Universe. It makes uh, a spider that's holding the secondary mirror, and they make mirror masks. Uh, so I added those two upgrades. So my nine hundred dollar scope doubled in price. And then you need about another thousand dollars for your Nexus reducer plus your one point oh corrector. And then you need collimation tools for a Newtonian. Uh, uh, you generally, you need a pretty good laser to, to do this and, and a few other uh, Cheshire and some other stuff like that. So in the meantime, I went ahead and I've just got this operational, uh, this EQ6 mount is gone and I'm using the CQ350. I did not need it uh, for the uh, eight inch Newtonian but I want to uh, get something with even more aperture and a little bit more. So I, I plan to add a 10 inch Newtonian or something else that would get me up to a thousand millimeters or so. So that, that's kind of how, that's where I got there. So here's what, the, here's what we have today. Uh, we're at native 800 uh, millimeters F4. Nexus reducer gets you down to 600 at F3 and with the, with the star zone at corrector. This is only about 20 pounds and it's an easy 20 pounds because on a scope with rings, you just open the rings and you just lift out the OTA. It's very easy to take out. It's very easy to put back in. Um, so that part of it's great. The quality, if anything, um, well, I'll talk about the filter wheel. Here was the primary reason to go with this. This is a seven position, two inch uh, filters. This thing is almost eight inches across and you put a 2600 camera plus this filter wheel, 
you probably have at least four pounds. And that's why he ended up replacing the focuser because the stock focuser just can't handle the weight. It would be wobbly and uh, the, the uh, Starlight Instruments focuser is just wonderful. It's super smooth. It's, it grabs on, it never slips. So uh, that's what I ended up there. So I'll give you my observations, conclusions. The C8 Hyper, with Cypress R AVX at 294 camera was a great place to start. Easy to use, lightweight, very fast optics, uh, limited on image size, uh, especially in galaxy season. Uh, when you added the reducer, uh, then you, you, you took care of your image size, but it was a pain in the rear to use the off-axis guider. If I had what's available today, it would it would be a better solution. But <clears throat> um, for me, the C11 and 183 was a good was good, but I never would have used it if I didn't use a a trolley, because I don't want to handle a 30 five pound scope payload and a 40 pound um, EQ6 mount head <laughs> plus, uh, you know, I had over a hundred pounds of, on that, uh, on that trolley, but because it was on a trolley, you roll it out, you lock it down five minutes to set up, everything's intact and it worked great, but couldn't get that filter wheel on it. And so if you want to shoot mono, you what I would used to do, I would I would shoot um, one of the filters and then I would change the filter and go to bed. Then I would shoot the other, the third filter the next night. Uh, so that worked, but it still um, was not where I wanted to go. I would say, if you have no intention of shooting mono, the what I would do is either that uh, C11 with the Hyperstar, but better than that, if your mount can handle it, I would go with what Doug Summers has, and that'd be the RAS 11 uh, and just get it on a mount that could handle it. I think you'd very be very pleased with the 620 focal length, uh, but that's going to be a heavy guy. And it, um, if you had it on a trolley like I do, it would be fine. But... Um, so the eight inch Newtonian solved all my issues with weight and with, um, focal length and with, uh, and the optics or the, the speed is okay. And it's actually a sharper image than what I was getting with the C11 Hyperstar. Can't explain it how eight inches performs <laughs> like an 11. I think it's maybe the inherent uh, style of the Newtonian scope uh, just seems to work. So the sharp, I, as I say, in my opinion, the sharpness overall quality of the images is, is as good or better. And it produces very tight pinpoint stars with little or no bloat. Now, you, <laughs> some people don't like the spikes. You either love them or hate them. If you're going to have a Newtonian or any anything that uses a spider to hold a secondary mirror, you're going to get the star spikes. They're just not optional. So if you don't like star spikes, don't get a Newtonian. <laughs> if you wonder about at, at 600 millimeters, here is my image size with some careful <laughs> uh, centering and rotation you can squeeze the rosette in. Of course, there's still some out on the edge that you could get. Uh, but then just zooming in here, you you still get good sharpness with that. So here's what I've got today with the, the new mount. And I had, as you can see, I upgraded to a short tube 80 guide scope. That's, I'm shoot, so I'm guiding at 400 millimeters and imaging at 600. With this rig, I can, I can shoot uh, four minute subs if I need to. So anyhow, that's all I have to say. Do we have any questions?
Um, oh. you, see, you keep mentioning a trolley. Is that like a scope buggy to like, you have yes. something like that? It's exactly like a scope buggy. Uh -huh. uh, the one I have is, is um, what's it called? Scope buggy. <laughs> scope buggy is what mine is. But yeah. it is, it's a form of a trolley. So but it, you, feel it, you have it all on, and then you just wheel it in and out. It's exactly like you see it here. Everything is, I don't do anything except wheel it out, lock it down. It, this scope has two jack or jack screws on all three corners. I have two holes drilled in my cement and I actually uh, run the drag, uh, jack screws into those holes. So I'm in exactly the same place every time. Now, as David pointed out, I don't know if it's about with the air or what, but I go ahead and I tweak the uh, uh, polar alignment. It's usually very minor. It takes, you know, two or three minutes and you're done. And once you've done that, unless I need to rotate the camera for some framing, I don't ever go out again. Everything's done from inside the house. And I put it away in the morning. Wow. Oh. So, uh, Randy, are you going to go back? Are you going to? Is this your system going forward? This is the system going forward. Uh, I, as I say, if I add something, it would be uh, an addition to this a ten-inch Newtonian. I'm actually looking at a uh, uh, a Mac Newt uh, uh, a Mac Newt. <laughs> Just it would be. Uh, It'd be like a thousand millimeter and you can't do anything. You're going to shoot a thousand millimeters or something like that. I just want to get a little bit more power, mainly for galaxy season. I will say with this rig and shooting at 800, this is the first galaxy season. I can say I enjoyed and look forward instead of saying, okay, I can only find six things that I can make six galaxies. I can make look good. <laughs> now I've, uh, uh, and with this rig, I'm able to shoot some galaxies. And particularly when I put that little 585 camera on here with a tiny sensor uh, and shooting at 252 uh, gain, uh, I was very pleased with, with the results I got for galaxies. So uh, you, so uh, you added a uh, moonlight focuser and the, uh, ZWO uh, focus motor works good with that? It's perfect, yeah. Absolutely, it works great. Those are good. I yeah. use that. Well, yeah. it so works we, very well. So, any, I, any other questions for Randy? I will say that. What's the capacity yeah. rating of that? Uh, uh, 350 pound or whatever that is. Uh, 50, 57 pounds. Okay. <laughs> It'll handle anything I can ever, me and my uh, neighbor can get up on top of it. So I will, I do need to say, uh, uh, collimating this uh, took a while to get onto it. Um, collimation changes. It's, the hyperstar collimation was super stable and and i in a, a, a scts are going to have stable collimation collim, <laughs> collimation this one is more fragile if you jar it you've got to recollimate it and periodically you need to check it uh but i've i have the right equipment to collimate it and any issues i've had uh, are easily handled by blur exterminator so, but you, that is, other than the star spikes, uh, the, the collimation is something that you have to put some time and energy into learning how to do it. Okay. So, anything else? Any other questions? I know. All right. Well, that was a, another great presentation, Randy, and thank you for sharing that. You're very uh, welcome. I'll, I hope everybody who uh, tuned in this evening uh, got a good feel for uh, two different systems that are very common for for astroimaging. And I think the fact that uh, David and Randy kind of shows how they uh, evolved from one system to another 
Uh, should give you some ideas of what you might want to think about doing with your own system in the future. Um, I, I want to remind you know, Greg, you... I think, if I may, I think okay. it's worth saying when you look at the images that Randy and David have produced each from the beginning of their careers, it underscores the old saying, it's not the camera, it's the <laughs> photographer. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. <clears throat> Well, the equipment helps, no question. Uh, yeah, it does. I've, <laughs> I can attest to that one, though. Yeah. But you can learn to get, learn to uh, outgrow it before you go to the next, the, the next level up. It's uh, yeah. that's one thing you want to do. <laughs> I wanted to remind everybody uh, that we're in the middle of the monsoon challenge. And though we haven't had any monsoon rains, we've had some clouds. And if you recall, the idea behind the monsoon challenge was uh, to shoot something, a uh, common target, uh, in spite of the clouds. So uh, we haven't had a lot of clouds the last few uh, weeks. So hopefully, I already, hopefully I already all, took those. I already took those. Good. Hopefully, uh, everybody's. Uh, shooting images of either M87 or NGC 6883. Um, and again, um, shoot those images. We'll share them at next month's uh, meeting. And uh, if you have images that you'd like to share, just send me uh, a private email telling me that you have images. You don't have to send me the image. You can do that yourself, but let me know that you do want to share your image. So. I have kind of a count of how many folks we have to go through. Um, and again, uh, if you have uh, images to share uh, of either of those two objects, they'll be featured in the uh, August issue of the Desert Sky Bulletin. So you can tell all your family and friends that you have published images. <laughs> any other way, comments uh, or questions? I, I got a question about uh, what made, uh, who chose those two objects, by the way? I did. Okay, uh, just out of curiosity, if you don't mind my asking, what made you choose NGC 6883? Well, I was working on the Astronomical League's Open Cluster um, Challenge, and 6883 wasn't in there, but it should be. Um, yeah. So it's a, a large um, open cluster um, in six, yeah. and so it should be a good target for... Uh, just about any type of setup, whether you have a um, an automated scope uh, or a 14-inch Celestron, uh, it should be uh, a target for you. Well, let's put it this way. I uh, I got a fantastic image of it, and but and the image did reveal some surprises about the object. Now <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll share them with you next month. Yeah, that's that's why I picked it. Yeah, there are some, uh, there are a couple of oddball things that were in that field. Yes, there and, are. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, again, and I'm sure others who, uh, uh, I got a surprisingly deep shot in, with 75 minutes worth of data. I just processed it. It's a uh, uh, I got a fantastic image using, uh, by the way, um, uh, who's that, uh, that last speaker, uh, Randy, was that? Uh, he was talking about, uh, you know, trying to photograph galaxies and he, yes, you need image scale and so forth. Um, I use a six inch refractor working at 980 millimeters focal length f6.4 and i have gotten some really good detail but i what i want to do is go to a 10 inch newtonium and i'm planning to use a four f4.8 negative or i'm sorry native focal length with a paracord uh, a teleview paracord and uh, also the a ZWO 2600 dual, which I've been using with my refractor. And, you know, we're talking about off-axis guiders and stuff. And 
you know, they can, you know, create problems. I used to use those back in the days of film and they've worked uh, fairly well, but they're awkward to, to, to reach. And anyway, this I like is because it's a, a, a the guider and the camera are, are both an integral unit. And as long as the thing can push it, put out a wide enough field, you've got to have enough of it so that there'll be light out uh, that'll reach the, uh, uh, you know, the little sensor for the, it, it's off to the side there uh, for the guide stars. But with the refractor, it works fantastically. It's, it's, uh, I would recommend it to anybody. And, you know, this could, uh, so uh, now I don't know how well that would have worked with that C11 with a re reducer that, uh, that he was showing. Um, I don't know how much, uh, I'd have to, to know what the linear field would have been uh, for that to work, but that could possibly have uh, eliminated a lot of problems. And in fact- yeah, I'm a bit surprised that uh, uh, SBIG hasn't sued uh, ZWO because you know they they do have a patent on the uh, secondary sensor that they've had for you know twenty years or so. So it's, it's yeah. kind of interesting that that hasn't occurred. And it added only two hundred dollars to the price. You can you can get the you know the the regular twenty six hundred or you can get it uh, you know with the uh, get the dual version. The difference is just and I was thinking. Boy, that's the best 200. I, I just decided that I had the regular 2600 I've been taking images with and then having a guide scope on there. But I like this idea. You don't have to put it, you don't have to put a guide scope and then you got to focus uh, periodically during the night. You got to focus the guide scope. Here, if the main scope is in focus, then the guide scope automatically is. Boom, it just takes care of it. And then you stick an EAF on that thing and uh, you know, you're ready to go. You just, uh, <laughs> it, it just takes, it just runs the uh, thing all night. You don't have to, once you push the button on auto run, boom. You're, and that's something, but as I say with a Newtonian and that I want to use this on that and I think it'll be big enough uh, to cover because the whole field of view is within about 40 millimeters. And I think if anything that can cover a 40 millimeter, if it can, like say, for example, if you can cover the view with a 30, uh, a 31 millimeter Nagler eyepiece visually, if you can see all of that, if it can, if it can fill a 31 millimeter Nagler eyepiece, it should fill uh, a, a, a 2600 dual. Okay, well, thank you hey, for Greg. that. And we'll actually look hey, forward to seeing the pictures. Yeah, Doug? So I just wanted to make clear just, uh, you know, we heard three different examples uh, tonight, and none of them spoke to plate scale. And I think it's important, maybe for, uh, you know, the newer folks to think about. Um, how important plate scale is because whether you're shooting at 1100 or 500 or 800 or whatever, nothing uh, compares to how you need to match your camera to the scene. The camera and the telescope should match the scene. And if you want to shoot galaxies with any kind of resolution or for that matter, planetary nebula, uh, you know, anything small, you're going to need resolution for. And so as a result of that, you need to be careful about the plate scale, which is the matching up of what, how many arc seconds per pixel are you talking about? And matching the scene to your to your system is all important because if you take that 2600 camera, for instance, and you put it on the wrong telescope, you're going to get great images and a big field for nebula, but you would not get uh, you know desirable images for galaxies out of that if you if you're shooting at let's say you know. Uh, two arc seconds per pixel, right? That's not going to work. And so I think it's important that people, before you run out and everybody buys a 2600 camera, think about what kind of go into Stellarium, go into your favorite uh, software, 
put the telescope and the camera together and see what your imaging plate scale is, and then try and match your seeing uh, like one third of your seeing or something on that order. And the reason why I say one third is because you want to sample that properly. And so just keep that in mind that, uh, you know, we need to take all of this with a grain of salt that the seeing yeah. uh, has, a, has a direct correlation to the camera you want to put on your telescope. Forget about how many millimeters your, uh, you know, your focal length is. More important is to match up the seeing in your camera and your telescope. Um, okay, I'd like to add to that uh, a little bit. Figuring, uh, you want to get figure your resolution, uh, your arc seconds per pixel. Uh, there's a quick formula for that. Uh, take divide 206 and a quarter by the focal length of your system in millimeters. Multiply the result by the, the pixel size in microns. And the result will be your resolution in arc seconds per pixel. 206, uh, take, remember that constant, 206.25. Divide that by the focal length of your system in millimeters and multiply the result by the pixel size in arc second, or I'm sorry, in microns. Um, my system usually works, and I know Doug's uh, was, uh, was also similar to what he was working with his Rasa there and with the camera that he was using, that we were, get, we were working at about 0 0.8 arc seconds uh, per pixel. And the results I think we've been both been getting have been phenomenal, like out of CAC. So it's probably a good one to shoot for. But, but yeah, CAC, there's nothing special about CAC other than it's a dark site. I think yes, most, that's right. We're yeah, at a lower elevation site, and so most amateur sites are going to be in the two arc second to three arc second category. So if you're shooting at 0.7, you know, seven times three, you know, you're in the you're in the seeing window. That's where you want to be. Take three yeah. pixels, three by three pixels, and those make the round stars, and that's going to produce a nice image. Um, if you're doing much more than that, then yeah, it's not going to be good. And I, I'd say rather than memorize the formula, Paul, just go put it in Stellarmate or Stellar, uh, uh, Stellarium, yeah, <laughs> or any of your other uh, favorite uh, planetarium software, and it'll automatically calculate those numbers for you. Uh huh. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, showing up this evening. Uh, keep working on those monsoon challenge images. Send me uh, your name if you have images to share at the July meeting, and we hope to see you then. All right. Thank you. Okay, good night. Night.